Hi, this is Chaplain Greg with The Wandering Wesleyan, and uh, we are going through our Walking in the Word series. And uh, if you are enjoying what you're watching, please like and subscribe on YouTube, leave a comment and share, and uh, we can get this material out to more people. So we are finishing up the historical books today. Think of how far we've come. We've come from beginning of Genesis, beginning of time and creation, all the way up into the exile and the return from exile. And uh, we are in Ezra, Ezra. And we were talking about, we were talking last week about Zerubbabel and his mission was to rebuild the temple. And he did so. And the temple was rebuilt despite stiff opposition from uh, his, the people surrounding, uh, but he still got it done. And they dedicated the temple and God didn't show up. There was no glory cloud. The presence of God was not in the temple. It's, uh, it's, it's sad. It's sad, really. And we were talking about how all three characters in the Ezra and Nehemiah scroll, scroll go through this pattern that a leader is sent, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel. Um, they encounter opposition. And then there's an unsatisfying ending. The building of the temple is not what it was with Solomon and God doesn't show up. And that brings us to Ezra. Ezra's name means help, which is interesting. And this is Ezra part two. This is 60 years after Zerubbabel. So Ezra is a scribe. He's a Torah scholar. He's a, he's a teacher and he gets permission from the emperor, the Persian emperor Artaxerxes, to lead a group of people back to Israel. And this is during the time when the building project of the temple has been halted. Remember that the, the, that the people surrounding Jerusalem wanted to participate in this, but they were pagans, they were idolatrous, they were not followers of Yahweh. Um, so they got Artaxerxes to put a stop to the building, but then Artaxerxes found a letter from Cyrus saying, yeah, they could go ahead and do this, so Artaxerxes started it up again. But there was a period of time when the building was halted. That's when Ezra is showing up. His job, Ezra's job, is to lead a revival of Yahweh worship. He wants to bring everything back to the way it was before. Now, you and I have been through a lot of Israel's history. I mean, what does that mean? Israel has always rebelled. Israel has always fallen short. But he wants to bring a revival of Yahweh worship back to Jerusalem, back to the temple. And when he enters the land, he learns that many of the exiles, Jews, who have returned previously, have now married intermarried among the neighbors, the pagan idol worshipers. This isn't good. So I want to read real quick Deuteronomy. Yeah, we're going to go back to Deuteronomy because really in a lot of ways, everything comes back to the Torah. And we're going to read Deuteronomy chapter 23. And uh, verses 1 through 4, no man, uh, let's start uh, number 2, no one of illegitimate birth may enter the Lord's assembly, none of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, may enter the Lord's assembly, no Amorite, Moabite may enter the Lord's assembly, none of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, may ever enter enter the Lord's assembly. This is because they did not meet with you with food and water on the journey after you came out of Egypt because of Balaam, the son of Beor from uh, Pethor was hired to curse you. Okay, why is that? They were not to intermarry with all of these people because these were enemies of God. These were not Yahweh worshipers. So when we go back to Ezra, and we read Ezra 9. And we're going to read 6 through 15. And this is Ezra's prayer. 
when he discovers that all of these Jewish folks who have come back from Babylon, Persia, have intermarried with the people. He says, my God, I am ashamed and I am embarrassed to lift my face towards you. My God, because our iniquities are higher than the heads and our guilt is as high as the heavens. Our guilt has been terrible from the days of our ancestors until the present. Because of our iniquities, we have been handed over along with our kings and priests to the surrounding kings, to the sword, captivity, plundering, and open shame as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, grace has come from the Yahweh our God, Yahweh Elohim, to preserve a remnant for us and give us a stake in this holy place, even in our slavery. God has given us a little relief and light to our eyes. Though we are slaves, our God has not abandoned us in our slavery. He has extended grace to us in the presence of the Persian kings, giving us relief so that we can rebuild the house of our God, repair its ruins to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Now, our God, what can we say in light of this? For we have abandoned the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, saying, the land you are inheriting to possess is an impure land. The surrounding peoples have filled it from end to end with their uncleanliness by their impurity and detestable practices. So do not give your daughter, listen, do not give your daughters to their sons in marriage, nor take their daughters for your sons. Never pursue their welfare or prosperity so that you will be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. After all of this happened to us because of our evil deeds and terrible guilt, though you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and have a lot of sur to survive, should we break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit these detestable practices? So Ezra is pleading to God because he sees the great sin. What is Ezra's posture? Ezra 10.1, while Ezra play, prayed and confessed, weeping and falling down, before the house of God, an extremely large assembly of Israelite men, men, women, and children gathered around him, and the people also wept bitterly. Ezra interceded on behalf of the people, on behalf of the people's sin, and the people came around him, and they felt that guilt as well. Ezra, under the influence of all the leaders in Jerusalem, now this is without consulting Yahweh, orders a mass divorce of all of these marriages. Some men divorce their wives, but not all. This is what I mean by unsatisfying ending. A leader sent down Ezra, he encounters opposition, the intermarriage, and an unsatisfying ending. Mass divorce, Eh, only some of them do. Which brings us to Nehemiah. And this is the last character we're going to talk about in history. Nehemiah, which means God comforts. Kind of a cool name. He's a cupbearer for Artaxerxes. So, a cupbearer is one who tastes the wine to make sure there's no poison in it before giving it to the king. It's an important job and it takes somebody who is who has a lot of trust from the king to do that. Um, he hears that the walls around Jerusalem are in bad shape. Yes, the temple is being rebuilt, but the walls around Jerusalem are in tough shape. So he's sent. So remember the pattern. The leader is sent. Nehemiah is sent. He prays a a prayer for boldness. Now let's go to Nehemiah 1, because this is worth this is worth reading. Um, it's a beautiful prayer. And Nehemiah is writing, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. He's talking about he heard that the walls around Jerusalem are crumbled and destroyed. 
When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the Lord of heavens. And I said, Lord, the God of heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear the servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly towards you and have not kept, kept your commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave to your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded to your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the peoples. That happened, exile. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished from the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I choose to have my name dwell, Jerusalem. They are in, they are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to that of your servants who delight and revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man, meaning King Artaxerxes. So Nehemiah goes to King Artaxerxes and he asks him, can I go back to Jerusalem? And Artaxerxes says, yes, go back to Jerusalem, repair the walls. The king permits him to go back and complete the job of wall building. He gets there and what happens? The leaders surrounding Jerusalem give him a hard time. Nehemiah tells them that they have no part in this project. And there's four, four guys, Sambalat, Tobiah, a group called the Arabs, Ammonites, Ashdenites. There's a bunch of people who threaten violence against the Jewish people rebuilding the walls. The people continue with the project they, with a sword in one hand and a shovel in the other. And that's from Nehemiah chapter 4, 16 and 17. The wall is completed and more exiles return. Ezra, we're bringing Ezra back in. He leads a religious revival. The Torah is read over seven days. The festival of booths is celebrated. There's a mass confession of sin, that's in chapter 9. There's a mass vow of faithfulness in chapter 10. Further resettlement progresses. And there is a dedication of the wall in chapter 12. This sounds all great, right? Until you hit chapter 13. Things get bad again. The temple is neglected. The people start working on the Sabbath. Commerce and markets are being set up in the wall where it was supposed to be defended. Now they're just, you know, doing business. Nehemiah 13.31 ends with this phrase, Remember me, my God, with favor. Nehemiah is writing, I tried. Oh well. And that's how the history ends. Pretty sad. Pretty sad when you think about the history of Israel being given the pathway of salvation. Adam, to Seth, to Noah, to Shem, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, to Judah, to David, the line of the Judean kings all coming from the line of David. The line of David being preserved. When we get into the Gospels a few weeks from now, we're going to see how important that is. And when Israel is kicked out of the promised land because of their sin, because of their idolatry, they're allowed to return. And when they're allowed to return, do you think they're completely repentant? No. They go back. And it really is an exposition of how we are. That even though we give our lives to God, even though we, uh, 
even though that we dedicate everything we have to him, we still fail because we're still human. We're still on this side of eternity. But we have the Holy Spirit. This is something that these folks didn't have. We have the Holy Spirit who continues to bless us with the presence of God. The presence of God was not in the second temple, but the presence of God is in us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's New Testament stuff. We're still in the Old Testament. So we finished history and we're gonna go into the wisdom literature next. All of this history that we've learned, keep in the back of your mind because it's gonna be important for understanding wisdom literature and the prophets. So until then, this is Chaplain Greg. If you are enjoying this video, please like and subscribe. And I will see you next week. God bless.